Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story. In revenge for their heartless demands, I buried his car in boxes of hoarded junk, costing them thousands. The second story. Department manager demands I finish all duties alone. I comply working slow. HR intervenes, manager fired. The third story. Customer complained about lack of eye contact while using the computer. In response, I maintained intense eye contact throughout the entire interaction. Now he avoids me. And the first story is, you want his car? Take his other crap first. My partner Carl and I were friends at first, and when he lost his house due to bankruptcy, he came to live with me. He had no job, lived in poverty on a disability pension, of which he gave his ex half, for 14 years since his wife left. In contrast, I owned my own house, had a successful business and was pretty independent. He was very handy around the house and loved puttering, talking with the neighbors and had a great sense of humor. He was clean and very easy to live with. We were together for 10 years. We treated each other well, but he had no rights to anything I owned and vice versa. I stayed away from his family drama as best I could. Carl had two adult kids, Margot, 28, and Todd, 35. The kids never visited their father ever, and when he called them, they rarely picked up or returned his calls. If they did pick up, they brushed him off or dismissed him entirely. I felt bad for him, but what could I do? They were like that for years before I met him. They were rude and nasty people, but he loved them and couldn't understand why they didn't have time to talk to him. Carl died suddenly one evening at 58. He had been in poor health, and finally his heart just gave out. Not 12 hours after he died, Margot called to ask if he had any life insurance. For a nanosecond, I thought that she was concerned about my finances handling the burial, etc. But no. She told me that according to their mother's separation agreement, he was supposed to keep life insurance on himself, and she and Todd were to be the beneficiaries. I guess he never told her that once she turned 18, he had cancelled his life insurance because he was on disability and could not afford it. He may have tried to tell her during one of those phone calls, who knows. Later the same day, Margot called and asked if he had a will. She told me that she had already been to a lawyer. This was the day after he died, and that because she suspected Carl didn't have a will, she would be his next of kin. She would be taking over the burial arrangements, etc., and she was the beneficiary of all of his stuff in my house, including his car, which was a used car but still newer than hers. I was pretty upset by the timing of all this, and couldn't believe they could be this mean and cruel. So soon after he died, he was their dad and loved them. She then told me she would be doing a walkthrough, my house to be sure I didn't miss anything, of his. That was where I said, no, you won't. Margot was really peeved about my refusal to let her into the house and to take the car that same day, and conveniently forgot to tell me where they were having the funeral. She didn't put it in the paper and she only told special people to where it was. I found out later it was three towns away, but she did let me know repeatedly that they wanted the car and all of his stuff out of my house. I knew that once she came to take the car, she would not be back to get the rest of his stuff, which she knew was nothing, of any value. I would be left to get rid of a monumental amount of stuff at my expense. Cue malicious compliance. Now dear Carl was a hoarder, and I mean that in the true sense of the word. Even if something was broken, useless, outdated, or worn out, he kept it. So he had four old style TVs, six giant toolboxes, eight computers, two dead barbecues, a floor model drill press that he was going to fix, a bandsaw he found in the dump, six stereo components. None of this stuff ever worked. He was saving them all for parts. Plus 198 boxes of metal parts from odd machines, trucks, cars, bulldozers, and buses that he salvaged and collected over the years. It was all in the garage, which he thought of as his man cave. 198 very heavy boxes. Guess they were packed quite full. Plus the pride of his collection, a 60-year-old five-ton metal lathe that Noah used to construct the ark. So I parked his car at the very back of my two-car garage, then shoved all the boxes of stuff in front of it, so that it was impossible to remove the car without taking everything out in front of it, including the metal lathe. It took two weeks and a lot of effort, but the garage was packed to the roof. I took a picture of the garage with the doors open. Margot and Todd soon started screaming to their lawyer that I was not cooperating in regards to the car. I responded that I needed to see a legal document that the car was in fact legally theirs, registered into their name and properly insured, in case they drove it away. I didn't want to be held liable. I also needed to have the rest of the stuff taken away. Plus, I had just had my driveway paved, so they had to have proper movers come to get his stuff. 
not just a couple of yahoos in a pickup truck that would damage the new driveway. They said that they would after they got the car. Their lawyers screamed that I was stalling and refusing to give up the car. He even went so far as to accuse me of selling the car. I sent the picture I had taken of the garage to my lawyer, proving that I still had the car. My lawyer said, where is it? I said, you can just barely see the roof, but it's there behind the boxes. He got a good laugh out of that. So Margo and Todd had to hire a moving and storage company to come and collect Carl's precious stuff. The metal lathe took four men and a special small tow motor machine thing to take it away. It took all day for them to empty that garage. I asked where were they taking it, and they said to a storage unit. The head mover said something to the effect that there was no way. This was going to fit in the one storage unit they had rented. Oh well. So in the end, the cost of the movers was $14,000. I heard this from his best friend, and who knows what the storage units cost and for how long they rented them. Perhaps they recouped some of the money they spent from selling scrap metal. Oh right, I almost forgot. They also had to pay for his funeral. Turns out I did have an insurance policy on him that I paid for and had planned to use for his burial, but since I wasn't told where the funeral was, I used the money to pay off my mortgage. It would have cost them nothing to be nice to the woman that looked after their dad for 10 years. Funnily enough, he bought the car for $6,000 a year prior to his death. They paid $14,000 plus the storage units to get it for free, plus the cost of the lawyer. I'm glad everything worked out for them and they got what they felt they deserved. The next story is, Department manager wants me to stay late to finish all duties. Sure. This happened a couple of years ago in December 2019. I got a job at a higher end grocery store in the area as I was planning on saving for when I started college in the fall of 2020. The store has all kinds of different departments like a market cafe, pizza and sub shop, cheese, etc. I aced my interview and was hired in the bakery department specifically for breads only. That'll be important later. The first four months was a breeze, but after COVID-19 ramped up, my doctor put me on leave until August. When I returned, a lot of people had quit the bakery. I was taking college classes now, so I was working night shift part-time from 5 to 9 p.m. My department manager Hannah informed me that they were short-staffed on nights, and I might be on my own one day a week. I was sure I would be getting help for the rest of the nights. Nope. Weeks go by and I barely get help. I'm burning myself out doing closing shift on my own, along with my schoolwork. No one was in the dessert or breakfast section, and I can't talk to anyone about it because they're gone by the time I clock in. I complained to the bread manager Jim, and he told me to talk to Hannah since she runs the whole department. Sure, fine. This is how the conversation went with Hannah. OP. Hey, I wanted to talk to you about the workload. A lot of day shift people leave their mess and can't clean up after themselves. I have to do that in my duties, which isn't fair. Are you hiring anybody for nights? I can't keep running around and using my inhaler so much too. Hannah. Oh yeah, we're having a hard time filling the night shift roles. We could always train you for desserts and breakfast. OP. That's not what I meant. I meant assistance, not more responsibility. I can't do everything in the bakery and close with only four hours. Hannah. Well, you can figure something out. Just make sure you don't leave a mess during closing though. You can't leave until everything's done. I can't leave until everything is done? Okay. Ever since she said that, I started documenting every time I had to do three jobs at once. I would take my sweet time when I didn't have class the next day, making sure I clocked out at 11 p.m. each time. The amount of stuff that kept piling up was ridiculous, but I was simply following her instructions. HR noticed my clock in and out times and wanted me to come by their office. I told them everything, including what Hannah said to me, along with the photos I took. Suddenly everything changed. At 9 o'clock sharp, they were kicking me out, and whatever was left for the morning. Ha! Huh. Hannah was reprimanded but wasn't fired until she was caught selling two-year-old expired pumpkin pies to customers during Thanksgiving. That day sure was a doozy. I was shocked when I saw all those empty boxes she already sold. Photos for context. I'm glad I didn't delete them. Even the F up day shift had by leaving bagels in the proof box all day, expecting me to clean it. Jokes on them, I didn't. They also hid dishes in the freezer in boxes from the health inspector. Truly ridiculous. And this is considered a high-end grocery store. Hmm. Edit. I was working morning shift and saw many of the habits they had when I was first hired, but it didn't affect me until I was working night shift alone. I had no idea how bad it was until I experienced it. During mornings, I always made sure to clean up after myself. Even the bread slicer, which can have caked on mess by the afternoon. Edit two. For those curious about the pumpkin pie incident, we were all working overtime and preparing for Thanksgiving. 
I heard from this older lady that works day shift that she was cleaning out the freezer and found two-year-old pies from a vendor we package and sell. She was asking Hannah what to do with them because there were a lot of them. I forgot how many were in a box. Hannah said just put a label on them and place them on display. We can get more profit that way. Excuse me, what? The older woman said she was shocked and used her PTO to leave early. She was scared of jeopardizing her job, but she told me it was weighing on her conscience and told the store manager. I truly forgot the woman's name, but she was extremely nice to me. There were about seven large boxes full of mini and large pumpkin pies. Hannah was promptly fired. Sweet karma. The third story is, you want eye contact? Okay, sir. Background. I used to work retail in a DVD and CD store that rhymes with Manatee, Australia. We had computers that we could use to find certain titles and artists in the store if we hadn't in stock or we could even order from any of the other 300 plus stores in the country and have it shipped to the store. Many people would use this for older CDs or collector items that were harder to get. One day an older bloke came in asking about a certain smaller 80s rock band that I can't remember. I looked on the computer for him and was able to track down their album names, which of those albums he wanted located the album in stores around the country and got his details to enter into the computer for when the albums arrived in store so that we could contact him. He thanked me and said that he was so happy that we could get these albums in for him and left the store. The next day I get called into the boss's office because of a customer complaint. It was and is my only ever complaint in any job for the past nine years of working. He had rang up and complained that while my service was lovely, I didn't make enough eye contact when I was using the computer. Cue malicious compliance. Three days later he came in because he had another band he wanted to order. Luckily I was working. As soon as he walked in, I greeted him with the biggest smile and locked him straight in the eyes. When he asked for if we had any of his band in stock, I typed it into the computer while maintaining direct eye contact. It took me about four tries to find the right keyboard letters as I wasn't that great at touch typing. He was starting to get annoyed, but he didn't voice it. Then I had to search what store location these albums were at. That took another couple of attempts to type. I turned the computer monitor around to the point it looked like it was going to snap off. I had to move displays from the counter which took more time, but finally I was able to set it up at such an angle that I could read it off with a quick glance, but also still maintain eye contact. At this point he started to squirm and look away but I was only beginning. Next was his detail in taking his deposit, normally $10. It took me a solid 6 attempts to enter his details into the system, as you had to select each box to type in, and that was hard considering I wasn't looking. At this point he had gone rather quiet and was looking at his shoes. When he handed me his money, I still maintained direct eye contact and even dropped it accidentally out of my hand, which then led me to awkwardly slap around on the counter until my hand found it. Wouldn't want to break that eye contact looking for a few coins. After all the typing attempts, it took me an extra 10 minutes to serve him, all because I couldn't look what he was doing. To this day, I've seen him a couple of times, but he won't come to my register, and he doesn't make eye contact or hides in the aisles until I'm busy with another customer. A shame, really, he had such lovely brown eyes. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new video comes out and hit the like button to support the channel. Have a good day.